welcome back to Point of Order on the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and she is back after a week of having no voice. She is back on the show. She is back to talk about the biggest political news stories here in the province of Alberta, but across the uh, Federation of Canada. Sarah Biggs, thank you so much for doing this once again. Happy to have you back on the show. Hey, Chris, how are you? I am doing fantastic. How's your voice doing? It's uh, to my uh, family's demise um, and despair. <laughs> my voice is back. Um, it's it was gone for two weeks. I was extremely sick, and you know I gotta thank my daughter and daycare germs for. Um, but you know, after a good round of antibiotics, we're we're back on track. I think um, I think the last time we heard your voice was on election night in Ontario, Thursday, June second, and I think at that time your voice was already gone, and we pushed it to the limit that night. The next morning, I'm like, I'm done. Can't do it anymore. Yeah, Dare no, I can't. Um, you know, I feel like it's coming back a little bit. <clears throat> it's not a hundred percent, but you know, it is what it is. We've been in the bubble for two years, right? So. If a bug that I haven't, if my, if a bug that my immune system I haven't seen in, you know, a few years, uh, you know, gets into my system, my body won't, my body won't be happy. About well, it. and I'm not sure what it's like down in the south uh, southwest, but up here in the northeast, I can tell you the pollen that is in this city right now is horrendous. <laughs> I, I took a duster to our bedroom one day, and the like the like the fine line of pollen that I found on my table that's right beside my window is like whoa. <laughs> oh, I need to power wash my deck furniture. It's like it's just so but the reason why we're seeing so much pollen so you know we're going to do a little uh, canadian moment here is because with the drought last year and that was so bad yep. the ecosystem and the trees are reacting being like oh shit we might die we need more of us so they're producing more pollen so that's why we're seeing that much pollen this year fun no. fact fun fact fun fact but before we get into the three points that we have to talk about today. Yeah. I'm going to turn the uh, mic over to you for a few seconds because I know you want to do just a quick clarification and after, or not a clarification, but just a transparency uh, note here. Yeah. And then I will talk about what we're going to be doing heading after that. So I'll, I'll head it over to you for about 30 seconds. Then I'll just jump in afterwards. You know, I've always believed in uh, transparent government, transparent comment uh, commentary. And, you know, I'm a very straightforward um, transparent per person. I think everybody can um, tell. Um, I'm going to have to um, remove myself from um, UCP leadership discussions as I have been retained as a campaign manager and a strategist for a campaign. So until the election, uh, the, the vote happens or until I have a job, um, you know, if I can <laughs> get... <laughs> uh, if I get a very thank you very much in two months, that's going to be the end of it. But no, I'm going to refrain um, from speaking um, on leadership uh, issue uh, matters. No, and under just because Go ahead. it wouldn't be fair. Just because it wouldn't be fair. No, um, and, and, and I, it would. I appreciate you being honest and upfront about that. Uh, Sarah and I had had a little bit of a discussion prior to this recording, and uh, I don't want to put her into an awkward position or ask her questions that might put her in jeopardy with a job. So uh, for my sake and her sake, we're going to be a little bit transparent and say we will be refraining. Sarah and I will be refraining from UCP conversations, I should say. That being said, I'm not going to stop talking about it. Uh, we do have a few other guests that are going to be coming on to talk about it they're not going to be during the point of order live shows but we do have our new regular tuesday uh, live night so you might be seeing a few candidates show up there so we will be talking about the ucp leadership as this progresses so thank you so much I think for your I need the chinese ball for a while just to yeah no, understandable so uh so if you're in if you're tuning in to listen about ucp leadership you're not going to get it tonight, but stay stay tuned because we have a lot of other things that we want to cover. And the first Can I thing, oh, no, oh God, no! Don't worry about it. Our listeners love you anyway. Um, but I want to talk about the big thing that has happened this week, and that is federal mandates mm -hmm. for COVID nineteen travel restrictions have been 
paused, and I'm using air quotes for those who are listening on Friday, paused because, and I just want to make sure I read this correctly, starting June 20th, 2022, at 12.01 a.m., vaccinations will no longer be required to board a plane or train in Canada. You still must wear a mask throughout your journey. This applies only to travel within Canada and flights or trains leaving Canada. Now, the the sort of the asterisks in this whole thing is if you are entering Canada from land. So if you're driving from the USA into Canada or if you're arriving by a boat, you will continue to need uh, entry, need to meet entry requirements such as vaccinations and testing, including cruise ships. So if you're arriving by boat or land. You're going to need uh, some vaccinations. If you're arriving from a la- uh, train or plane, you're good, except for a mask. Um, this is a long time coming for a lot of people in this province and a lot of people yeah. across this country. What it, were your initial thoughts when you heard that uh, the Minister of Transportation, Minister of Health, and Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs were dropping these measures earlier this week? It was a long time coming. Like, we... <sighs> How could I say we they are suspending so there's a lot the the message is carried in a very careful manner right now so um I guess um you know my my, my analysis from this is that if we see a seven wave um that would be very taxing on our healthcare system including uh there's going to be a mix of influenza a and b as well um so you know in the fall it could be very we could have another strong wave um we could see requirements being put back on Uh, but I'm having a little bit of a hard time understanding the bit that if you arrive by plane you're fine but by boat there's no I I do not understand the reasoning behind that one some more regularity uh, regularities across the board would have been nice Um, and I and I completely agree with you on that one because For a plane, you're still stuck within a small uh, confine. And I I just got back from a trip from to Ontario and I'm back here now. I can tell you that it was uh, interesting, to say the least. Um, You are more close in close contact with people in a plane than you are in a boat. That being said, I know... The one big thing that sparked this whole travel restrictions was the cruise industry, cruise line industry back in 2020, because there was a lot of people getting sick very quickly on cruise lines. And I don't remember it being a, that big of a deal on, on airplanes. It could have been. I just don't remember quite clearly right now. So well, I, people are constantly masked and not living in the communal environment for seven or 21 days, right? Exactly. It's very different. But if you arrive by car, it's even less dangerous than arriving unmasked, unvaccinated by plane. So I think that the government should be working messaging and there's a constant, um, you know, there's been a constant throughout a different level of governments throughout COVID is the lack of consistent messaging and a lack of really straightforward communication. So it's gonna be interesting to see how they will accommodate, but hey, if, you you know for the ten percent of the population and did not get vaccinated in the past two years. Well, have fun in Mexico. Um, so I, I'm just reading the news release that just uh, that came out earlier this week, and the reason uh, the Canadian government is giving about cruise ships is given the unique nature of cruise ships, including the fact, as you just said, that passengers are in close contact with each other over an extended period of time. They, vaccinations against COVID nineteen is still required, so that is the reason, like you just said, yeah. it's fair. But by land. Yeah, well, technically, you can drive across the border. Can you? Yeah, no. Hold on two seconds. Now, no. Now you're not. No, it's just no. You're right. It's just by air. But at the same time, we don't have the. I, I, I hate to put it this way, and then this is going to sound very stupid to me, but um, no. We can't control what the states put in place, right? Because the states still technically have that law that you have to be vaccinated to cross the border, if I'm not mistaken. So it's not like Canada can go to Joe Biden and say, we're dropping it, so you have to drop it as well. Joe Biden has the right to refuse entry to anyone as long as you're vaccinated. So it's not a Canadian issue anymore. It's an American issue. 
Well, it's a, it's the whole thing with the Freedom Convoys that we saw in February, right? Like we, even if we would have dropped the, even if the federal government would have dropped the mandates, um, American customs still had instructions to follow. Yeah. So as long as Biden is not willing to drop their those restrictions and those mandates, well, I'm sorry, guys, SOL, like there's nothing we can do. We can go and throw a temper tantrum in Washington if we want. How successful is it going to be? Probably just as successful as a Jason Kenney speech in front of a Senate. Um, I will say that there have been media reports that Joe Biden is looking at dropping those requirements for cross-border yeah. drivers uh, to enter the USA. Um, there has been reports that this uh, COVID-19 is not done. It's going to possibly rear its head in uh, the fall. I'm hoping not, knock on wood. I'm hoping that it's done and over with and we can sort of get back to semi-normality as much as we possibly want it to. Um, I want to ask the big overarching question, though, because yeah. we can talk about COVID-19 restrictions. We can talk about the mandates being dropped, but... At the end of the day, Justin Trudeau was in a tough spot here because the lines at the airports were getting longer, especially at Pearson. Um, people were getting more fed up. Is this Justin Trudeau sort of responding to what he should have done months ago? Or is this Justin Trudeau, as he is saying, following the science, in your opinion? I think he's following the signs. Um, you know, we are not in a wave right now. Sorry, uh, I just got saw a tweet that Michelle Garner just, uh, Michelle Rempel just announced that she is seriously considering a bid for um, the UCP leadership. La, so, la, 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 la. I'm not hearing this. I'm not hearing this, Sarah. <laughs> yes, it's an information piece. I will not provide any professional opinion on the matter. There I you just go. received. <laughs> I just received a notification, but no, like we are right now dealing with a, you know, a dip in cases. It's okay to reopen. It's fine. As long as it's safe for everyone. Yeah. Uh, I'm expecting, you know, we're going to see um, probably vaccines for little ones. I'm hoping soon um, for the under five crowd. Um, you know, when cases are low, why not? I'm more than happy. But, you know, at the end of the day, if it's going to overwhelm our healthcare system, um, I think we, we we need to put a collective effort to, to try to prevent that. You know, if grandpa has a heart attack, we got to make sure you can make it to the hospital. Well, ex um, exactly. Know. We don't want what happened in last September where we saw a increase, not only here in Alberta, but across the political spectrum, uh, plus yeah. the political confederation that we have. Um, it yeah. is an interesting moment we live in, and it might be just a snapshot, and it's where we are now, but we are heading into a new unknown, and let's see what happens yeah. after this. Will this alleviate some of the travel issues that are at Pearson at some of the airports? I don't think so. I don't think so. It's always been a shit show over there. Well, like, sorry, part of French. But see, the other day, so here's the thing. The other day, I was in Vancouver coming back from a vacation with my daughter. And we were in line in the domestic uh, security check. There was one security spot open. Yeah. One. We waited two and a half hours. I arrived three hours and early for my flight. The flight was delayed 20 minutes, and I just made it. I think that there's a lot of um, human resources problem and mismanagement. Uh, we just kept, you know, the, the vaccine mandates and the mandates in general needs to stop being the general's scapegoat for um, the cluster F that we're seeing everywhere. Um, sometimes it's just because there's just not enough staff or things are being mismanaged. Like we need to, it's like, blaming Justin Trudeau because you fell off your bike. You just, it doesn't make any sense. Well, and that's, that's my concern. That's my big thing that I want to put on the record here is 
the the I I I forget what uh, news show I was listening to. It was a podcast that I listened to on. I think it was actually the Curse of Politics because I always want to try and credit the people who say things smarter than I do. But I was listening to the Curse of Politics, and I think it was Scott Reed, the liberal uh, speechwriter for Paul Martin, on there. He said the communications at Air Canada and WestJet has been fantastic because they have laid the blame squarely on Justin Trudeau's feet on this one for the mandates. It's not the staffing issues, according to them. It's Justin Trudeau and the mandates, which is ironic because as you said, and I've seen it too in Toronto Pearson Airport, there was three out of the eight uh, uh, security checkpoints open when I was coming back from Calgary from Ontario and this was back in uh, May and I was like this is not a federal government issue this is a all-around issue this is a airport issue this is a border security issue this is a Air Canada and WestJet issue because we were supposed to be able to check in three hours beforehand and I always like the early flights like I get on the plane like like the red eye but in the morning like six o'clock in the morning so I arrived at the airport at like midnight the night before because I didn't want to buy an extra hotel room for the night so I got to the yeah. airport and on their tickets and through Air Canada it says hey you can check in three hours beforehand we weren't able to check in until an hour and a half beforehand because people were arriving late and the people who were supposed to arrive they didn't so it was a very gong show of an issue so this is not an Air Canada issue this is not a WestJet issue this is not a government of Canada it's an everyone issue and i say that an airport management issue and honestly when you have like the president of WestJet making comments on social media like he did this week and then you have our premier retweeting it and finding it funny yeah it doesn't help with the discourse it's just more fuel on the fire constantly i feel like we're not able to have a adult conversation about what the real issues out are and we're just blaming either COVID, vaccine mandate, lockdown, or Trudeau on everything. But a lot of the issues is airline management. It's how, uh, you know, security services are, airports are being managed. Or maybe because we removed those mask mandate, there's more staff getting sick. Yeah. Have we thought about that for a second? Probably not. No. But, um... oh, but you know. It, it, exactly it is what it is now uh, just for transparency's sake we do have to try to keep on top of things because sarah is about to head back out on the road and uh get back out on the campaign trail so we want to make sure that we keep okay. to time so we have about another okay. 15 20 minutes so that we have with sarah and then we're going to be cutting it yeah. short here today but i'm glad that sarah is able to come back on uh the next topic i want to talk about is the emergencies yeah. act and this is the big thing that's been dominating uh canadian politics right now is the emergencies act yeah. with the senate hearings or the hearings that they've been going through and um it came out early last week or i think even a little bit before then that um no police chief whether it be ottawa windsor even here in coots alberta um called for the use of the emergencies act even though minister of public safety uh mario Mars, uh, the minister of public safety i don't know how to pronounce his last name and i don't want to even try right now um said that uh, it has, so they were asked for the implementation of the Emergencies Act. The Conservatives are calling for a, the minister to resign, for Justin Trudeau to fire the minister. Is is this going to happen? Because I remember way back when, when uh, Pierre Polyev said something stupid and the Liberals and the NDP jumped on him to get him to resign and he didn't. He apologized and we moved on. Is this just opposition tactics of trying to get people to resign here? Fuddle duddle. <laughs> uh, you know, we never know. So here's the thing. When emergency, when situations like, you know, the convoys in Ottawa, you know, the capital was literally under siege for three weeks, paralyzed, yeah. not able to do anything. Um, you know, they, they were part in having hot tub parties in front of Parliament Hill. Um, all my years in Parliament Hill, I wish I could have had a hard hunt to party on Wellington. That would have been sweet. Um, but, you know, we don't know what's happening behind closed doors. We do not know what threats, uh, you know, the elected officials were exposed to. Um, if we remember in 77 with the FLQ, 
um, the Emergency Act was, um, you the know, the War triggered. Measures Act. The War Measures, the Act. War Measures <laughs> Act. I'm sorry. The War Measures Act. I was born six years later, so I wasn't there. And it's the year my parents got married. But at the end of the day, we don't know what's happening behind closed doors. We do not know what kind of threats were assessed. We do not know, you know, uh, what kind of communication channels they had with those groups. Um, and the police, well, there was only so much they could do. But again, um, you know, when you see the Ottawa police hire a big firm like Navigator for crisis management, it's like, what is going on? Because Navigator is like one of the heavy, heavy firm in the country. Um, but again, um, Mr. Trudeau's version, like, Everything There's seems to story. change every five minutes with Mr. Trudeau. When it's, this is you know, it's getting, but uh, Trudeau's losing his shining star too. He's starting to lose his cool hair status. He's not as, you know, in 2015, he was a sunny ways, fresh yeah. air. Harper was here for 10 years. Um, we're just tired. 2019 it was, okay, we gave you a mandate. We'll... 2015, uh, 2020. One was like, oh, okay, well, because you know the other side's not much better right now, so we rather <laughs> stick with you. Exactly. Um, and like deciding to uh, keep your mother-in-law over for dinner and for an overnight sleepover, but we'll see what's gonna happen. Bill Blair um, said that you know they did not request, but we saw maybe they didn't ask for the emergency act. But maybe what, who knows what triggered Trudeau to make such a decision? Was it when the kids were at the bridge used as like a wall, a wall of kids trying to block everything? Yeah. Like what was this tipping point for Justin Trudeau? Was it, was his family threatened? Was it, you know, we don't know. Yeah. There's a lot of things that we do not know, but there's the thing we know is that Trudeau is not as shiny as what he was in 2015. And um, I don't think it's going to bring to a resignation, but I think that the succession plan could be accelerated. You know, the dude's been dealing with that for two years. He's been pulling up. And I'm not trying to be a Trudeau apologist here, but the dude's been trying to figure out to deal how to deal with a, a virus that we barely know anything about. With, the, you know, the Facebook crowd, do your own research. I know everything because Facebook told me that it was true versus public health, versus the provinces, versus everything in the world. Um, you know, I remember when, when it started and we were worried we wouldn't have enough N95s. And I, I remember when I saw like that Trump was going to stop imports of N95s in Canada, I just started bawling because I knew how important, you know, as a nurse, I knew how important those N95s were. But we can gotta give the guy a little bit of a break he's been working non-stop for two and a half years well the guy's I, I think there's a lot of people out there who might not who might disagree with you on working 24 7 or for two and a half or uh, uh, for the majority of two and a half years because let's be honest Sorry, every seven, every seven. A, every politician has taken breaks during this covid some yeah, went to it. some it. So, some went to hawaii some went to mexico some went to uh their cottage <laughs> Well, the cottage is federal jurisdiction. I, I'm talking about Premier Doug Ford. D Premier oh, Doug so Ford. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just saying provincial and provincial leaders did leave as well. It's not like a Justin Trudeau hasn't taken vacations. It's just. No. And he has taken, but the guy had literally the lives of everyone in this country on his shoulders. And if he would have, no, no matter what the call would have been, no matter what the call Trudeau would have done, 50% of the population would have been dissatisfied with him. Oh, that's always the case, right? Yeah. You know, no matter what they do, no matter what they say, there was always the very French, the 5 to 10%. Then you have the entire Trudeau crowd is about 35 to 40%. And then you have the rest that were like, well, you know, we're just going to be, you know, but it's everybody's tired. Everyone's tired and everyone wants a scapegoat. They want to blame someone, right? And that's that's where I, I'm going to sound like the Trudeau apologist now is 
Trudeau had some did some things wrong. Jason Kenney did some things wrong. Doug Ford did some things wrong. Scott Moe did some things wrong. It's just it's easy to gang no up one, on the. No one's perfect. No, exactly. We didn't know what we were dealing with. You know, it's when you have a virus that you barely understand how it works, how it attacks and constantly mutates. We went from a very deadly alpha strain to a very deadly delta to a still very deadly Omicron, but attacking the, you know, we thought it was a respiratory disease, but then we realized that it was attacking the nervous system and the circulatory system as well. When you have a virus that is like the all included of illnesses and attacks all of your systems. There's so much, you know, and, and I really don't want to be apologetic for anyone, but at the end of the day, nothing could have prepared us for this. No. And can we blame everybody? I don't think pointing fingers, we need to heal. And I don't think that pointing fingers right now is going, going to do us any service. No, and I agree with that. But thank you so much for going down that rabbit hole with me, Sarah. Um, the last topic I want to talk about, because we always talk about three sh topics on the point of order, and that is <laughs> caucus and sorry, I, I shouldn't say caucus, but I should say party party unity. Um, over the last two weeks, actually, I would say even a little bit before that, I, I would say uh, since about March of this year, um, we have seen the Alberta NDP kind of going through a uh, – a public divorce with each other because it seems like some of the volunteers are not enjoying the way that uh, the uh, party is handling some of the nomination candidacies. Now, um, for those who are about to attack me, attack me or attack uh, Sarah, um, we did say publicly that she is uh, she's working on a campaign for the UCP leadership. Uh, last yeah. week, if you remember, we had a former NDP candidate come on to talk about the conservatives. So, yes, from time to time, we have the other side talking about what the other party is doing. So, Sarah. Everybody knows they're being right down in the middle. So Exactly. Um, I want to know your stance because I've seen it from the Ontario Liberals side. You've probably seen it from yeah. more of a conservative side. How hard is it to keep a party unified with uh, nomination battles that go on across the province when you have so many contested nominations when their candidate doesn't win? No, I can actually talk to you about the NDP side because I'm very familiar with what's going on with the NDP right now. So, you know, we got to put everything in situation. So right now, so we got to go back to the basics. Right now, we are dealing with a two-party system in the province. And whether you like it or not, we're dealing with two-party systems. Um, the Alberta Liberals had a leadership race announced this week. I saw the email. Um, and the Alberta NDP, while well, they're doing their thing, and, you know, they just keep trucking. Um, so just for clarification what, point, I just want to I just want to jump in here for two seconds yes. on, on the Alberta Liberal Party. Um, we just sat down with a potential candidate for the Alberta Liberals who Ooh. who is uh, I'm going to let you talk. I'm going to talk about two seconds who is not an official candidate yet because yeah. she is having issues with the rules she is an Edmontonian. She ran for the leadership of the Libertarian Party. She ran for the leadership of the Freedom Conservative Party, and now is she ru she's running for the leadership of the. Oh, but she is, uh, she is ex wanting to run for the leadership of the Alberta Liberal Party because she's a card carrying member of the Liberal Party. Um, that episode will be airing next week, so please what? tune in for that. Sorry. So, so there's there's my there's my little plug for next week's episode. Next Wednesday, that episode will be. What? Aired. Yep. So, <laughs> we'll talk about it off record here. <laughs> okay. So let's go back to basics. It's pretty much a two party system. So when. <laughs> you have ideological parties like the NDP and it's very leftist, socialist, labor party, workers party, you know, it carries different values than the ECP, which is free enterprise, freedom, personal responsibilities and all that. So very often, like, you know, everybody hates on the centrists, but the centrists don't have a home. 
So to in order to attract those voters, sometimes, and if the NDP is trying to go back in power, they need to go appeal to that very, like there, I would say there's about 35% of voters that you could get in that kind of middle clump if you want. So for some, the party went too much to the center. For some, the party went too much on the right. To some, um, they feel like they stopped being listened to because, uh, you know, there's a lot of issues in every single organization. No one will be perfect. But what we have seen from both sides recently proves that more than ever, we need to implement proper policies and employee management systems and you know, to have a better oversight over the people who are dealing with those volunteers or you know, for chief of staff or for anything, right? We're talking about those sensi sensitiv sensitivity training and all that. Um, you know, we really need to further the conversation on how we're treating everyone. Now, I've seen people treated badly everywhere. This is not new. This has happened since I've been involved in politics. Uh, I've been treated not in a great way in a few times. Um, it's unfortunate, but it does happen. Now, there's always two sides to a story, and I'm really not trying to side with anyone here. But, you know, um, maybe sometimes the entitlement is a little high. I have not watched. Uh, I've been extremely busy. I've been, you know, kind of in my bubble these days. Um, but I think that we, you know, just, it is important to move forward it is, it is important to speak up, but there's a way to do it. No, and uh, sorry, continue on if you need to. And, and you know, and also I would have seen um, the NDP leader to come forward and release a statement or something, or have some media availability to be able to address those issues, right? Mm -hmm. This goes back to the the topic around Justin Trudeau about if he did something, 50% of the population would either hate him or love him. This is with yeah. any political party. And I and I, I say this with all respect because I was I was there when Dalton McGinty was in the power. I was there when uh, Kathleen – I wasn't there when Kathleen won. But it's always hard to keep a coalition, especially when you're trying to win the center together, right? We saw that with Jason yeah. Kenney. To keep the coalition together, it's hard. Um, we uh, see that with the Rachel – Notley. It's hard to keep the coalition together because you're always going to have people who feel burned at the last minute. So it seems like you're either damned if you do, damned if you don't. So I, I, I don't know the internal issues that are going on because I'm not privy to that information. Well, maybe we do. Well, we, 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 we only get the one side, right? We're only getting the one side. And that's uh, as as a journalist, as someone who uh, as a journalist, as a host of a show, uh, I look at everything from both sides and the lens half full, half empty, right? Because I want to know yeah. both sides, and this goes back to the conservative leadership. I had a I had a Twitter, a, an Instagram fight with a former member of Parliament, the former Minister of Health Tony Clement, uh, when uh, Pierre came out and said that they raised three hundred eighteen thousand uh, memberships, and I said, "Well, where are they from?" And he goes, they're from Ugh. everywhere. Well, that doesn't help me because everywhere means you could have sold one membership in Durham and 317,000 in Calgary Center doesn't mean you're going to win. Well, do you not believe me? No, I do believe you. Just like I believe Patrick Brown sold 115,000 and John Charest believes he has a path to victory. So yeah. I don't know both sides until I know both sides. So. Uh, I, I'm waiting for Je uh, Rachel Notley to come out with a statement. I'm waiting for something to s drop to say, okay, this is what we're going to do. But it seems like they're plugging their ears and going, la, 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 la. we're not listening. Yeah, we'll see what's going to happen this week. It's going to be interesting to see. I would say stay tuned. Um, uh, we might talk about it next Wednesday. <laughs> maybe. Maybe, 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 maybe yes, not. I'm going to be in town next one day so we can do a longer episode exactly then we can do a longer episode and we might bring someone on to the show to chat as well um for me that would be fun it would be it would be um i want to leave with this sarah we are 
just about uh, to wrap up here, we have talked about three major issues that have happened. Emergencies Act with the vaccine mandate, with party discipline. I know we could probably go into longer, but you have to go. Um, what are you looking forward to the next week? Is there anything on your radar that could be potentially coming up uh, federally or municipally or even provincially? Oh, I'm hoping for a very, very boring. Uh, very, I could use a boring week. Um, I, I'm begging for boring weeks. Um, I, I'm going to be digging into the city of Calgary, super expensive climate plan, three billions a year until I don't know. I, I feel like I haven't read enough about it. I need to dig into it. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what's going to be happening next few weeks with that. Hopefully the city won't flood. Um, you know, I got a love, love, family lobster boil on Saturday. So, um, you know, I'd like to be able to to go. But no, we'll, we'll see what's going to happen. We'll see how. Um, and I think that you know, it's going to be to see interest. Uh, we're in a very caretaker government state right now in the province. There's a lot of ministers wearing multiple hats. Will We're there be will there be a cabinet shuffle? There might be a cabinet shuffle between now and next Wednesday as well. Who knows? I think he's just gonna keep it plain and boring. Summer's coming. Calgary Stampede. Who's looking for for to all those barbecues? I know. I'm only getting one, but so we'll see. Well, let's let's do it. You I and need me. To go um, I'm gonna do a shameless plug here because I uh, it's my show and that's what I like to do. Um, this okay. Saturday in Calgary, yes. the Calgary Brain Tumor, the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada is holding their annual Brain Tumor Walk, where we are raising money. Um, I, I was gonna wait till uh, Friday, but I'm gonna announce um, during the month of May. Uh, I said to everyone who was listening to the show, any money that the show raised, we would be donating it to the Calgary, uh, to the Brain Tumor Foundation Walk uh, to help cure, help families like mine who have suffered through brain tumors uh, cope, but get the, the resources that they need. Uh, it's a great organization. So during the month of May, I said any money that we raise, whether it be through our Patreon, whether it be through monthly donations, we would collect all of it and make a, do a month a donation in the show's name. So I'm pleased to say that we've raised over $575 during the month of uh, May towards it. So that plus the, as of recording this Wednesday night, over $700 that the a pledge fund that we've been putting out there on social media throughout the last few months has raised over seven hundred dollars. So we're we're aiming for fifteen hundred dollars by the end of uh, Saturday to have raised for the uh, Canadian Brain Tumor Foundation. Uh, if you can head over to our social media pages, the links are there to donate. $10, $20, it helps. Um, there's a lot of families out there right now who are struggling with this, especially during COVID-19. It was not fun. Um, the people, the, 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 the foundation is a great organization. The people at the Tom Baker, um, the people at the Tom Baker have been fantastic. So if you can, even $20, it does go a long way and it does hopefully get us to that $1,500 mark that we're trying to get to. So there's my shameless plug. The walk is this Saturday. Uh, I, I forget the name of the park, but it's over in the south, uh, the Northwest. We will be there. My husband and I, we're going to go for a quick Pardon me? I'll be there too. Sarah's I'll be gonna, there. Sarah and I will be meeting back up. Uh, it's from 10 to 1. We're going to show up just for about uh, an hour, do a bit of a walk, meet the people who are uh, volunteers there. So if you can, all the information will be in the the, uh, the social media feeds. So please check it out. Highly recommend it. Again, I'm shamelessly plugging this because I think it's a great organization. And it's maybe if you show up, maybe it's just if. If you know I show up and people show up, maybe they'll find out who I'm working for. There you go. There you go. Might show up on a Saturday and you might see who uh, Sarah's working for, or no, just please, or just please. randomly check Sarah's uh, Twitter feed. <laughs> um. <laughs> So I, I want to thank Sarah so much for doing this because we, I told her 40 minutes. We're at the 41 minute mark. So that way she can get on the road and get back out on the campaign. I can trail. go pack. There you go. Um, Sarah, pack, yeah. Sarah, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure as always. 
Thank you. We'll see you next week. Uh, we'll see. We'll see you Saturday in person, but we'll see you back here live on Point of Order on Wednesday at seven forty-five. Talk to you later, everyone. Bye.